The Whistler. Sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Like anyone else, Van Barkley gave little thought to the precarious nature of everyday living. Had he had occasion to probe the fact, he might have acknowledged that danger is always present and that it can strike quite suddenly. Only Van Barkley wasn't thinking about such things. Perhaps he was too restless to care. A young engineer, unmarried, can get restless. Working in a new, strange city, he can get lonesome, too. Van Barkley was one or the other. Or both of these things on a Saturday night. But he came out of a movie and went for a stroll along the Santa Monica Palisades in preference to going back to his hotel room. On a corner, he stopped to light a cigarette. That's when he first noticed it. The car was big and Nash convertible. It cruised by him, came back around the block moving slow. The third time around, he was standing on the curb, staring openly at the girl behind the wheel. It was very nice. Young, blonde, considerably more than attractive. And she was looking at him just as obvious. Hello. Hello. You've opened a door before, no doubt. Hmm. In other words, isn't it a beautiful night for a drive? Well, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> That's what I said. You weren't going somewhere important. No, no, not at the moment. In fact, I was faced with a rather gloomy prospect of an evening at a hotel alone. And it is a beautiful night for a drive. Uh, I suppose it was on the golf course at Biarritz. What? Where we met. That's as good a place as any. Yes, only I've never been there. But I have a good imagination. And then... I remember so well those evenings at Monte Carlo when you'd say to me, Van, you must sit beside me at the casino tonight. You bring me luck. You called me Van in those days, remember? Never Mr. Barclay. And I used to call you, uh, uh, what was it I used to call you? It might have been Darling, mightn't it? Uh, yes, might have been at that. Or maybe the mystery woman, huh? Beautiful. Fascinating and unpredictable, especially unpredictable. Oh, that's not very flattering, Mr. Barkley. You might have said, especially beautiful. Yeah, I might have, and meant it. Okay, you win. You're not only beautiful and fascinating and unpredictable, but you're too fast a worker for me. How come? How come what? All this. You're not happy about taking a drive with me, Mr. Barkley? I'm delirious. But why me? What I got? Well, you're not unattractive, you know. Yeah, but baby, you never saw me before. How do you know what I'm like? Perhaps I like to take chances. Didn't your mother ever warn you about picking up strange men on the street? My mother was rather unusual, Mr. Barkley. She taught me that when I wanted something, there was only one thing to do. Get out and find it. Uh -huh. Okay, who's kicking? You'll pardon me if I pinch myself. This is something I wouldn't have believed. Sort of like an angel from heaven dropping in your lap. Oh, oh I'm no angel, Mr. Barkley. Would you like a drink? You're driving. Then come on, we'll go in. Oh, this is the swankiest roadhouse I ever saw. Oh, it's not a roadhouse. I live here. Come on. Uh, it's not a bad little place to hang your hat? <laughs> hang it, then. 
We like it here. Probably have two or three scattered around the country. Oh, no, no. Just a cabin at Lake Anderson. Mm -hmm. Well, I gather you're not worrying much about any wolves howling at your door. Not that kind, anyway. The guy that owns this place must be a movie producer, your father. My father. And he's not a movie producer, just an art collector. Uh, perhaps you'd like to take a look around. We have some very nice paintings scattered all over the house. You think we can find our way without a guide? There's no one else here, if that's what you mean. We only have one servant now. This is her night off. It's cozy, isn't it? The whole place to ourselves, all 50 rooms. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. We'll take a look as soon as we have that drink, I promised you. You feel like pinching yourself, don't you, Ben? This is the kind of thing that just doesn't happen. But it's real. She's real. And she's even more attractive than she looked in the car. And it isn't the cocktails you've had. Finally, she leads you into the library. Like this room, Ben? Very much. Always wanted something like this. The right sort of library is good for a man. I designed this myself. Mm-hmm. Even no interior decorating, huh? You're, uh, pretty complete. <laughs> Thank you. Then, fix yourself another drink. The decanter is over there. I'll be right back. Well, take your time. This is all very pleasant. You fix another drink. Sink into a big leather chair and relax. When you open your eyes a few minutes later, she's back, smiling down at you. Hello. Hello again. Oh, I see your glass is empty. Well, that's easily remedied. I'll pour you another one. Well, this is nice work, if you can get it. <laughs> Here you are. Thank you. Nice perfume you're wearing. Like it? I like everything about you. Good. Then you won't mind doing something for me, will you? Anything, short of murder. Walk over here. To the closet? Yes. Yeah? Now, open the door. There's something I want you to see. Okay. I'll play games with you. I... Hey, I thought you said we were alone. We are, Mr. Barkley. Because, you see, the gentleman in the closet is quite dead. It's a great deal more than you bargained for, isn't it, Ben? Yes. When you stepped into the car at the invitation of the beautiful blonde, you didn't realize what kind of a ride was ahead. It was like a dream, wasn't it? Going to her home having cocktails and relax. And then in the library, you looked into the closet. Fantastic, Van. Your mind spins, almost unable to cope with the situation, as you stare down at the quiet figure of a dead man on the floor of the closet. You scarcely hear the girl beside you. You'll help me, won't you? Huh? What'd you say? All you have to do is help me hide him permanently. Now, wait a There's minute. There's a place out in the garden where some newly turned earth wouldn't be noticed, but I'm not much good at digging graves. Uh-uh, baby. You can count me out. I don't know how this guy happens to have a hole in his head, and I'm not asking any questions, but just count me out on any part of his You deal. said you'd do anything for me. Yeah, but I don't go off the deep end for anybody, especially for a girl who's in the habit of keeping dead bodies lying around. Uh-uh. No, lady. Pardon me. Well, I'll be seeing I think you'd better wait, Mr. Barkley. Oh. Yeah. I see what you mean. I see you're wearing a gun, too. Uh-huh. And I assure you I know how to use it. How can I doubt that, with the evidence staring me in the face? Good. That if you'll just pick up our late departed friend and come with me, I'll show you the place. You know that business about your being no angel? I'm just about convinced. You carry the body downstairs as she demands and go out into the garden. There's a shovel. Start digging. Like I said, dig it big. Sounds like a beach near here. The back of the yard drops off to the beach. But never mind, you've got other things to do. Dig deep and wide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, baby. A heavy shovel full of dirt in her face knocks her off her feet. At the same time, you're leaping clear, racing for the drop-off at the back of the property. 
It's a wild, frightening scramble down through the rock and brush until you hit the beach, running hard. There are no shots, no footsteps. You're away, Van. Free. Far down the beach, you work your way back up to the highway. Catch the bus for town and the safety of your hotel room. You're too upset to decide what to do that night. You want to call the police. But the memory of that blonde hair and those pale blue eyes stops you. You want to be sure before doing anything that will send her to the gas chamber. You turn in without deciding. Next morning, when you go downstairs, the desk clerk hands you something. Good morning, Mr. Barkley. Morning. What's this? A young lady left it late last night. Well, there's nothing written on the envelope. She just told me to put it in your box. Oh, well, thanks. Hmm. That looks awful green. Yeah, a hundred dollar bill. And no note, no nothing? No. Nope. I wish I knew your secret, Mr. Barkley. You'd like to know that secret yourself, wouldn't you, Van? Now more than ever. One hundred dollars to pay for your silence. And probably a chance of more if you live up to the bargain. But there's also a chance to play it smart, isn't there? If you can find out more about this girl, her name, what's behind it all. You catch the bus again, and as you approach the big house, there seems to be quite a few people around. At the gas station on the corner, you find out why. All set, Mr. Armstrong. Anything else? That's all, Joe. Thanks. Hi there. What can I do for you, mister? Run out of gas or something? No. No, I was just walking, and I saw there was some kind of excitement around here. Yeah, more than we've had in a long time. They found a body down on the beach this morning. Oh, somebody drowned? Maybe so, but he got a bullet hole through his forehead first. Oh, murder, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Guy named Alfred Hamilton lived right up the street. Over in that house? Ridgely's? Oh, no. He used to be over there a lot, but he didn't live there. Well, I noticed that there was a police car out in front. No, that's part of the excitement. Not only is this friend of the Ridgely's bumped off, but Doris is missing. Doris? Yeah, Doris Ridgely, Mr. Ridgely's daughter. Well, that's uh, Ridgely the art collector? Sure, sure, you know. He's about the richest person in the neighborhood. Nice man, too. Mm -hmm. And Doris, his daughter. I remember, I've seen her. She's a blonde, isn't she? Good-looking? Mm, that isn't the word for that girl. She's a peach, and she's beautiful. Yes, but uh, rather hard and spoiled. Doris? No. Why, there isn't a nicer girl in town, and I ought to know. I've been taking care of her car ever since she started to drive. I sure hate to see her mixed up in anything like this. And missing, too. Why, she might be in the ocean herself, only her car is gone, too. Mm. They think she murdered this guy, Hamilton? I don't know. But if you ask me, she couldn't have. She's too regular. And if she did, she had a good reason. Hamilton was no good. I never could understand why Doris and old man Ridgely put up with him. There's just the two of them live there, huh? Yeah, Mrs. Ridgely died a while back. Gosh, I hope they find the girl okay. He'd just about kill the old man if anything happened to her. Yeah. When was this guy murdered? Last night. And I can tell you exactly when. Ten minutes to eight on the nose. Oh? How can you be sure? Because I heard the shot. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but I did notice what time it was, because I was just getting ready to close up. Did you tell the police that? Yeah, sure, sure. Where did the shot come from? How should I know? It was just a noise. Maybe it was from the house over there, maybe it was from the beach where they found him. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hey, you. say, who are you anyway? Nobody important. So long. As you walk away, you feel sure about one thing, that Doris didn't murder Hamilton at all. She was covering for somebody else, wasn't she, Dan? And you've got to find her and bring her back. But, but where is she? Suddenly it hits you. The cabin she mentioned. Yes, at Anderson Lake. You decide quickly, Van. Next stop, Anderson Lake. Uh, hello there, young fella. What can I do for you? Got everything here body needs. Groceries, notions, drugs, fishing, tackle. Oh, no, I was looking for somebody, Pop. Thought maybe you could give me directions. Well, I'm the person to come to. Can tell you about anybody in Anderson Lake. And who you're looking for? Doris Ridgely. She's got a cabin up here, hasn't she? Yep. Well, uh, how do I get there? And you don't. Huh? Why not? Wouldn't do you no good. Why not? Nobody there. But I'm sure Doris is up here, and I've got to find her. Well, if you got eyes in your head, you wouldn't have to go to no cabin. Huh? <laughs> if you look across the street over there, you'll see her car in front of Jake's Cafe. She's eating inside. 
Okay. Thanks, Pop. She's in Jake's cafe. And you wait outside until she comes out. As she gets into the convertible, you slip around the other side and open the door. Oh, Hello, uh, baby. It's a nice day for a drive, isn't it? Mr. Barkley. Don't reach you... for your bag. I'll take it instead. Oh. I'll take a look inside, too. Yeah, just as I thought the gun. You still got it. Well, I'll just keep it this time, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Barkley... Now, just a minute. I'll do the talking this time. First, I'll give this back to you. Even if I had a price for this sort of thing, it wouldn't be $100. It's all I had last night. I said even if I had a price. I don't. I'll keep my mouth shut until I'm ready to talk. Or you are. But what makes you think I have anything to talk about? Now, look. I think I know a good kid when I see one. If you're really in trouble, I'm sorry. But I don't think you are. I don't think you killed this heel, Hamilton. I think you're covering up for somebody. No, no, I'm not. I, I killed him. He was threatening me. Threatening to, to, to tell something about me, and I killed him. I don't believe you. All you did was try to get me to help cover up somebody else's work. No, that's not true. Okay, so you're not ready to talk yet. Come on, let's go for a drive. Well... You know, I'm sorry I had to smother you with that shovel full of dirt last night. But I didn't like the prospect of sharing that hole in the ground with Hamilton. You mean you thought I'd... Oh, no, I never intended to do that. Well, how'd you think you'd get away with it then? Just let me walk away to tell oh, the cops? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, baby, keep your chin up. Of course you don't know. You were mixed up in something you knew nothing about. Well, you couldn't have killed this guy, Hamilton, any more than you could have killed me. So, come on. Come clean. I... No, I, I can't. Right, now, look, whoever this is you're covering up for, they'll be found out eventually. Probably they had a good reason for doing this, from what I hear about Hamilton. But now you've got to get yourself off the spot, and me, too. We're accessories to the murder. Yes, I know. I... Look, why are you doing this? Why did you come here? I'll show you why. Does that answer your question? I... I... No talking now. Come on, start driving. We've got to have a little talk with the police. Well, Van, you found her, and she's grateful. You can see that. The way she smiles at you weakly, wonderingly. And perhaps later, when it's all over, you can pick up the dream where it left off. You think about it, you drive back to the city with her. Then as she swings the big convertible into San Vicente Boulevard, she suddenly slams on the brakes beside a police squad car. Hey, what's the idea, baby? We don't want a squad car. We want to go to police Officer? headquarters. Officer! Arrest this man. He's wanted for murder. And be careful. He's got a gun. You can't believe it's happening, can you, Van? But it is. And later at police headquarters, your dream has turned into a nightmare as Doris pours out a wild story to the chief of the Homicide Bureau. Yes, y yes, they, they were both at my house last night. They left together. Then I, I heard a shot. When I went out looking, I found Mr. Barkley standing over Hamilton's body down on the beach. He, he'd taken his wallet. What? You'll find it in his pocket right now. The officer here already has the murder gun. Are you kidding? Why, I haven't any wallet. I don't easy, have a... Easy, easy now. Well, seems you do have a wallet, Mr. You Barkley. You see, Sergeant? Yeah, but... She put it there. She slipped it in my pocket while we were driving. This is Hamilton's wallet, and this is the same caliber gun that killed him, Barkley. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. It's all a lie. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Ridgely. Thanks for coming right over. Well, that's right, Sergeant. He didn't kill him. Dad. It's no use, Doris. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you can't protect me. Dad, please don't say anything. I said it's no use, dear. You can release them, Sergeant. This young man and my daughter... I killed Hamilton. He was no good. I... I shot and killed him. The surprises are hitting you like punches from a fighter, aren't they, Van? The attempted frame against you by Doris. And now, out of the blue, her father facing the police, admitting that he killed Hamilton. You stare from one to the other, wondering and waiting. And then Doris breaks the silence. But, Dad, you couldn't have killed Hamilton. Why couldn't he? He just confessed. That's good enough for me. He confessed to protect me. Dad had no reason. He to... could have had the best reason in the world, blackmail. That was Hamilton's racket. Blackmail? And that's the answer, Doris. Hamilton had been bleeding me for a long time. But a few days ago, I got the evidence to clear myself and expose him. So you sent for him and told him. He got tough and... Uh... I shot him. I had to. In self oh, look, officer, you found the gun in Hamilton's wallet on this man right here. What more do you want? I tell you, I never saw this girl in my life until last night. It's no use, Doris. It happened exactly as I said. No, Dad, I know you didn't do it. There's only one way you could know, Miss Ridgely. Yes, Sergeant. 
There's only one way I could know. I tell you my daughter is lying. Mr. Ridgely is right, Sergeant. What? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Find anything? Plenty. Your daughter's lying to protect him. We know from the gas station attendant's testimony that the shot that killed Hamilton was fired last night at ten minutes to eight. We've checked every move of Miss Ridgely's, and at ten minutes of eight, she was seen buying a pack of cigarettes at the corner drugstore. And it was Mr. Ridgely. Uh-uh. Mr. Ridgely left Hamilton in his living room last night somewhere around seven o'clock. Probably after telling him he was going to expose him to the police. At ten minutes to eight, Mr. Ridgely was seen having a drink at the sea house. So, Barkley, you did take Hamilton's wallet. It was your gun. I tell you, I never even heard of any of these people. It I... wasn't young Romeo here either. And who? Alfred Hamilton committed suicide. Suicide? What? That's right. There's no doubt about it. Powder burns on his face. He was left-handed. The angle of the bullet in the left temple shows the wound was self-inflicted. And tests prove beyond a doubt that Hamilton fired a shot a few seconds before his death. I guess when he realized Mr. Risley was going to expose him to the police, he just couldn't take it. Now, Mr. Risley, if you'll come into my office a minute, I'll show you the reports. Uh, Dad, we'll wait in the car. I'll be along in a minute, Dora. Well, baby... He gave me a nice ride. A very nice ride. Oh, honestly, Vanna, I'm terribly sorry, but I was worried crazy about Dad. Van, do you think we could have that drink again? Sometime, maybe? Oh, look, you're a nice kid. You're beautiful, fascinating, all those things. Especially beautiful. But, baby, if you ever see me walking down the street again... Just go on by, please. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Hazel Lytle and John Dunkel. Music by Wilbur Hatch. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when this will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.